Today we have two exciting topics which are going today uh, we have two exciting topics which are going to be shared by two esteemed speakers. Uh, first is Dr. Ahmad Suhailan bin Muhammad, and second is Dr. Ruth Sabrina binti Safari. Being stuck at home for long periods during COVID pandemic has led to many of us wanting to seek out greenery and explore the great outdoors. Whether it's a relaxing trail or perhaps a more challenging and adventurous climb, what do we need to know about these activities, especially when it comes to managing medical emergencies? Well, our expert, Dr. Ahmad Suhailan, will guide you through. Dr. Suhailan is an emergent, uh, consultant emergency physician in our National Heart Institute or IJN. He obtained his MBBS in University of Sydney, Australia and Master of University yeah. Science Malaysia. He is an instructor in various life support courses such as uh, Advanced uh, Cardiac Life Support, AHA version, uh, Advanced Trauma Life Support, Aquatic Life Support, Wilderness Life Support, and also wind focus ultrasound. Besides active in teaching, he is also an avid hiker. He has conquered Mount Kinabalu not once, uh, not once, but twice. Others include uh, Gokyori in Nepal, uh, Mount Pulok in the Philippines, Mount Fansipan in Vietnam, and Mount Rinjani in Lombok, Indonesia, just to name a few. Okay, so without further ado, let's hear from the expert, Dr. Suhailan, with the talk on Understanding High Attitude Cerebral Edema or HACE. Dr. Uh, Sarant, welcome. Thank you, Chow. Can you just, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. I'll just share you my slide. Uh, thank, uh, you. thank you. Thank uh, you. Good morning. Assalamu alaikum. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the Euro Emergency Medicine SIG for the uh, invitation. Um, I think uh, it all started by Dr. Nasrida um, inviting me to, to give a talk last year. It was back in October. And um, I agreed. And um, and time went fast, uh, and Dr. Chow, uh, very organized, uh, keep reminding me every month, uh, and I only got to do it in the last two weeks. Yeah? So great master, great procrastinator, yeah? procrastinator, sorry. Uh, however, uh, thank you for the invitation, and ladies and gentlemen, thank you for spending your Saturday morning. Uh, it is a beautiful day outside, but uh, you, you, you opt to uh, do this uh, CME, yeah? Okay, um, I would like to acknowledge a few people first before I begin. Uh, these are the people who assisted me a lot in uh, preparing for this lecture. The uh, Jack Naim, uh, who's uh, EP, uh, budding EP from Tawa Hospital. Uh, he's actively involved in uh, wilderness and Australian medicine in Malaysia. Uh, Mr. Dan Chi, uh, he has a lot of um, um, is a wilderness expert and also a member of WAMS, Dr. Atfina, who I will share with you uh, a brilliant study uh, on high altitude uh, sickness, and also Dr. Azmi, whose presentation I used immensely during my hike uh, up Tokyo in October last year. So we all are bounded by uh, one interest, which is uh, wilderness and osteo medicine. Uh, WAMS is a society. Uh, where we promote uh, medicine in Austria and a uh, resource limited environment. Uh, but I would like to correct uh, Dr. Chow, I'm not an expert. Um, there are many other experts in this area. However, what I bring to the table is a lot of experience. Um, these are the mountains which uh, I was fortunate to climb. And the one in uh, orange are the ones which I suffered myself, AMS, and the other mountains which I climbed I managed to treat uh, my colleagues or even other uh, climbers uh, for uh, AMS. So uh, when I give this talk, I, I can give it uh, emphatically, emphatically, and uh, hopefully uh, you will enjoy this talk as I enjoy preparing. Uh, 
So the outline of today's lecture, we will start with a little bit of introduction, uh, a lot of definition because uh, definitions are important uh, in terms of uh, defining properly so we can do research and we can compare and contrast. Uh, our main uh, thing is about pathophysiology, how ACE or uh, AMS uh, occurs in us human. We will look at treatment. And I think most importantly for us, uh, we will look at how we can prevent uh, of, uh, prevent ACE and AMS from occurring. Now, why is this topic becoming more relevant to us today? Because there's actually high demand in um, hiking, right? in hiking mountains, in adventurous holidays. There are people climb uh, to high altitude to track, uh, they climb to ski. Uh, but there are also soldiers, uh, miners, yeah, who have to, go up, uh, to work. So these are people who might uh, be at risk of acute mountain sickness, and because of the sheer number of uh, people going up the mountain, uh, AMS uh, has become a common. And you look at this photo. Um, this is in Everest, and just look at the sheer volume of people lining up to climb basically it's causing a traffic jam anybody can climb these days and uh, for example like kinabalu you can just go and climb uh, it doesn't matter how badly you're prepared uh, most climbers may not have any idea about the track because we rely on our guide our travel agency uh, maybe we are too busy so we don't have time to study about about hiking on a high altitude and uh, probably we're not prepared so um, we uh, in terms of our fitness and medical problems so most hikers may have a lot of comorbidities for example hypertension or even some some heart problems so we have health care professionals uh, whether you're a doctor, you're a nurse, or a paramedic, you need to be familiarized with high altitude medical problem because if you're the medical personnel who hikes, highly likely they will come and turn to you. What about the incidence of AMS? It ranges from 28 and uh, globally. Uh, my smile. The significant morbidity and uh, mortality, yeah, uh, despite. Uh, advances in uh, in medicine, and uh, I'm sure most of us are aware of the recent death toll in Everest, which involves probably two Malaysian. Yeah, back in May 2023. Now Mount Everest is above 8,000 meters, and the higher you go, the more risk you are having the case. However, it does happen even in Mount Kinabalu, which is half the height of uh, Everest. Yeah, uh, uh, low speed is about 4,100 meters. And uh, this was back uh, this year, back in April. And when you look at the age, they are quite young, yeah? husband and wife, and uh, started with headache, respiratory difficulties. So patient probably had acute long-term sickness and one of them uh, succumbed to the illness. Yeah? So um, most of the slides that I will share with you today, look at the photo from uh, my recent hike up uh, to Lake Gokyo. Uh, Lake Gokyo is in Nepal. Uh, if uh, you are familiar with Everest Space Camp, it's the same route as Everest Space Camp, but it's actually more scenic, less congested. Yeah, and uh, it's actually uh, the altitude is almost the same as the Everest Space Camp (EBC). Yeah? So you fly into Lukla. Lukla, which is one of the most dangerous airport in the world. And uh, we spent about nine days hiking to Namche Bazaar, which we spent a few days acclimatizing all the way up to Lake Tokyo, which uh, took us about nine days. This is my group, which consists of 11 people. <clears throat> Three of them were females. Um, uh, and uh, out of the 11, only three were below 50 year old. Yeah? So most of us, uh, were about 50, and uh, we knew the risk. Uh, we knew uh, our age might be a factor, so we prepared and we brought a whole lot of medication with us, which I will share with you in the next following slides. Okay. Okay, 
so um, through these nine days, we went through uh, turquoise colored rivers, uh, amazing uh, mountain range views, and we encountered a lot of beautiful animals, uh, which is only, which can only be found uh, in this region. So this is Yak uh, carrying uh, our luggage. Yeah? A bit of definition about altitude. Yeah? So high altitude is the altitude more than 1,500 meters up to 3,500 meters. Yeah? Um, and um, uh, when you hike at this level, uh, anything above 2,500 meters, you are at risk of developing AMS, acute mountain sickness. Uh, actually, it can occur in height uh, around 2,000 meters. So uh, when you go to Kundasang, it's about uh, 1,900 meters. So if you go and hike in Kinabalu, you are actually you can be at risk. What happens at this height? Uh, there are physiological effects in terms of your inspired oxygen yeah, uh, will decrease. This will cause you to decrease your exercise performance. You will increase your ventilation. You will tend to hyperventilate and your PaCO2, your arterial CO2 will go down. Your saturation will hang around 90, yeah, 92, 93%. It's still okay. Uh, however, pay, uh, p uh, people who suffered AMS are actually more from this group because a large number of people do ascend rapidly to these heights, eh? and um, uh, most of the uh, most of the uh, cities in the high altitude is within this range. What about if you go further? A very high altitude. So just now was high altitude. Now it's very high altitude. It's from three thousand five to five thousand five. This is when your saturation starts to fall. You will go below ninety percent, and when you're sleeping, it might go lower. And this corresponds to your arterial oxygen uh, pressure of less than fifty millimeters mercury. If you go very high, for example Mount Everest, then it's it's basically. Uh, uh, not not suited for us. Yeah, you will suffer from marked hypoxemia uh, because of your hyperventilation. Your CO two will go down. You have hypocapnia, and uh, it will cause you to become alcoholic. Yeah, there's uh, 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 neurological uh, effects, uh, deterioration of your neurological uh, augmentation and all. And there's no permanent human habitat beyond this altitude. So this is Lake Gokyo. The uh, the, our uh, primary objective uh, during the hike, it's at the elevation of 4,790 meters. So just to show you the uh, height of uh, different uh, mountains. So Everest is about 8,800 meters. And um, you heard about Kalimanjaro, it's about 6,000 meters. Gokyuri is around five. 357. Ri means peak, so it's the peak of Gokyo. There's a lake below. Kinabalu, low peak is about 495. The higher you go up, the higher you go up, yeah, the altitude, your pressure, uh, barometric pressure will decrease. Now, um, because of your inspired oxygen pressure relies on your barometric pressure, your inspired oxygen will also decrease, and this will cause a lot of uh, effects on your body. Uh, uh, to name uh, a few would be your neurological status. Yeah? So if this happened in acutely, very acutely, you will get um, uh, you will get in, in, in acute decompression. For example, when an aircraft decompress, uh, you know the oxygen um, uh, uh, oxygen mass is supposed to drop and you're supposed to wear your oxygen. Uh, but if you uh, lose, uh, decomp if the aircraft decompresses at high altitude, you have about 60 seconds be before you lose consciousness. And then you will have, uh, uh, and then uh, without, without treatment, uh, within 60 to 90 minutes, uh, you will succumb. Yeah? However, um, people, um, uh, people do hike to this level of uh, altitude slowly. Yeah? When you hike slowly, there's a process called acclimatization, which your body slowly adjusts. It takes weeks to achieve this height, um, and that's what we will be covering today. So you will say, um, uh, you know, this is irrelevant because you don't hike, you don't go up uh, Mount Everest. Uh, so these are all the peaks uh, in the world, which is uh, above uh, 8,000 meters, Mount Everest, and most, most of them are in Nepal, Pakistan, and Tibet. However, there are 
certain locations in the world where people live at high altitude. For example, Tibet, uh, uh, Lhasa, Tibet uh, in China, it's at 3,600 meters. In Bolivia, even in Mexico, you know, there are cities where they are located at quite high altitude. In Malaysia, the highest settlement in Malaysia is Kundasa. It's a beautiful city, a beautiful town. You should go. Uh, it's at 1,900 meters. Um, and uh, when you start the hike of Kinabalu, normally we will start at Tindu. It's about uh, there, 1,900 meters. We will go and hike all the way up to Iman Rata, which takes three hours. It can be up to seven hours. Um, uh, up to Laban Rata, which is at the elevation of 3,272 meters. This is where you rest overnight. So this is your sleeping uh, altitude, which is important. I will explain later. Early the next morning at 2 o'clock, you will start your summit up to low speak. Uh, many people aim to uh, arrive just before the sunrise. And at low speak, your elevation is around 4,095, or about 4,100 meters. This is the highest scalable mountain in Southeast Asia. So every year, more than 29,000 climbers uh, go to Kinabalu. And they are at risk of high altitude sickness because of the rapid uh, ascent uh, rate uh, within a short period of time. You're supposed to go up and come back within two days, yeah? And, um, and uh, yeah, within 24 hours. So making them susceptible to uh, AMS. A little bit about definition uh, on high altitude illness. It's cerebral and pulmonary syndrome that occurs uh, following an initial uh, climb up to the altitude of 2,000 to 2,500 meters. Yeah? And why does this happen? It's because of hypoxia. When the pressure up in the mountain is low, we call it hypobaric hypoxia. The effects on the body is different from isobaric hypoxia, which we will discuss later. So because of the hypoxic stress at high altitude, there's extra sensation of fluid in the brain. So that's why you get edema, you will get AMS, dizziness, headache, and, and, and uh, if it worsens, you might have neurological symptoms and signs. And if the fluid uh, leaks in the lung, you will get uh, high altitude pulmonary edema. So HAI includes AMS, which also includes high altitude headache. Uh, severe, severe form of AMS is haste, high altitude cerebral edema, and the pulmonary form of uh, severe HAI is high altitude pulmonary edema. Today we will concentrate on AMS and haste. Um, clinically, these syndromes overlap. So AMS and haste is actually like a spectrum, uh, same pathophysiological process, but as uh, the condition gets worse, we will go towards cerebral edema. AMS is the most common form of HAI. Basically, you have to have headache with other uh, non-specific symptoms. We have a, um, a score for that. Uh, HACE, uh, fortunately, is the least common of uh, illnesses at high altitude. However, it is potentially fatal. So let's talk about uh, high altitude headache. Now, high altitude headache is uh, described as bilateral, frontal or frontal temporal. It's dull, pressing in quality, it can be mild to moderate intensity. And when you uh, move or when you pray, it just gets worse. Yeah? And uh, it normally happens at an altitude more than 2,500 meters, uh, develops within 24 hours of climbing. And when you descend, the headache goes away uh, faster. Uh, and 80% of people who who hike up the mountain will experience high altitude headache. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to uh, distinguish it from other uh, causes of headache, for example, migraine or dehydration. Yeah? So how should we treat um, the headache? Uh, symptomatically uh, with Panadol or non-steroidal. I had this in my first hike up Kinabalu. I didn't know what it was. So despite paracetamol and Ponson, it didn't go away. So I slept uh, on it and the next morning it was okay. So I was acclimatized. Eh? So you should rehydrate, halt, ascent, just rest and recover. And if it's worse and it doesn't improve despite treatment or despite uh, 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 trying to acclimatize, probably you have to descend. Yeah? And uh, actually, if you have oxygen and you apply it to yourself you, uh, when you're having your headache, it 
uh, rapidly resolves uh, the headache. And this is one of the ways you want to know the difference between high altitude headache versus migraine. With oxygen, later on in the pathophysiology, we will see that it reverses the cerebral vasodilation. Hypoxia causes uh, cerebral vasodilation, and that contributes to the high altitude headache. And uh, next is acute mountain sickness. So it's just a progression of uh, high altitude headache. Remember, in MS, you have to have headache. In an unclimatized person who recently climbed up to the altitude of 2,500, plus one of the following symptoms. So you can either have headache plus a GIT, nausea, anorexia or vomiting or dizziness or lightheadedness or a lassitude and fatigue. And there is a scoring system to grade the severity of AMS. Now, the likelihood of developing AMS is dependent on your rate of ascent. The faster you uh, go up, uh, the higher the chances of AMS. What's your sleeping altitude? If you go up and sleep high without acclimatizing, you are at risk to duration of altitude. If you go up and down very quick, you might not be, uh, your body might not get a haze, but if you stay at high altitude longer, the risk is higher. Level of exertion, if you run up to Laban Rata, highly likely you might get uh, AMS uh, in the next few hours. If you uh, have been to high altitude recently, uh, that is protective uh, for you. And there's also uh, inherent physiological, maybe genetic susceptibility. Some people are susceptible, some people are not. Yeah? So this is the scoring score, uh, which grades uh, the severity of MS. It's called Lake Louis uh, MS score. Lake Louis is in Canada. We did a conference there and we decided to do a score. So it's basically the severity of each symptoms, whether it's headache, uh, GIT symptoms, uh, appetite, nausea, vomiting, yeah? fatigue and, or dizziness, fatigue uh, and dizziness and lightheadedness. And normally when we hike up the mountain, you will get a headache and your appetite will, will go away and you won't start eating or drinking and that just worsens in. You can grade it from zero to three. So I think the total mark will be uh, 12. Uh, mild is three to five, moderate is six to nine and severe is 10 to 12. This is the revised Lake Louise AMS score. The old one had a total mark of 15. They removed the element of sleep oh and it's been, uh, it's been simplified. So that's us. We were happy, you know, at, uh, at the beginning, but slowly and surely uh, we developed headache. Yeah, uh, Some of them are a bit resistant to headache, but on a high altitude, can I do that? Yeah. So um, just to summarize, um, uh, AMS uh, symptoms is headache. Uh, it can be mild, it can be moderate or severe, depending on the score uh, it's from zero to three. But uh, basically, there's no physical signs. Eh? There's no physical, physical sign. So um, for that, AMS is classified solely on the basis of symptoms. Yeah, symptoms. Okay, if uh, on the other end of the spectrum is haze, high altitude cerebral edema, uh, this is life threatening, yeah, and it's diagnosed clinically in people who recently arrived at high altitude, and most of them would have AMS. They would have headache first and just progress, uh, uh, and 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 most of them would would either have AMS or I uh, have uh, pulmonary complication of high altitude. But they have physical signs, yeah. Uh, basically, they have ataxic gait, they're confused, they're consciousness level. And some of them might be in deep coma. The prevalence is lower than AMS. It's about 0.5 to 1% as compared to AMS, which is more common, about 25 to 50%. So this is haze. Haze should not be confused with AMS. AMS is less severe, uh, self-limiting with treatment, but with haze, it's life-threatening and um, Treatment has to be instituted fast. Uh, it might include uh, descending to a lower altitude. These are other neurological complication of uh, high altitude. You can have transemic, transient ischemic attacks from, uh, uh, um, from mesospasm. Yeah? Uh, when, you, when you go up the mountain, uh, uh, your right to left shunt of the heart increases and that might uh, encourage something to embolize through the foramen ovale, so that might contribute 
to the PIA or stroke when you uh, hike on high altitude. A little bit about incidence of these conditions. Now in Malaysia, uh, there's a good study by uh, Dr. Atfina and team. I think back then she was in uh, QE in Kota Kinabalu. Uh, 2018, she spent eight days up Mount Kinabalu, uh, getting some uh, data and doing some study. So her team studied the incidence of severity of uh, AMS and associate factors at Mount Kinabalu. They surveyed 345 climbers, giving uh, the uh, Dick Lewis questionnaire, and uh, they assess uh, these climbers at Laban Rata on day one and Low Street on day two. The incidence was about 24% on day one and about 22, about 21.7% on day two. Majority were mild, only mild cases of AMS, headache, yeah. Uh, few were moderate, there were no cases of haze or hate, and the most common symptoms were fatigue and headache, followed by dizziness, and the least common symptoms was uh, GIT symptoms. And these are the cumulative incidents according to altitude. Uh, uh, not surprisingly, the higher you go, the, uh, the more chances you might get uh, um, AMS. And, uh, the average uh, SpO2 at Laban Rata was about 87%. Uh, it's interesting to know that uh, out of the 345 climbers, one quarter, 25% experienced AMS, mild to moderate. And 60% um, uh, of the climbers had no clue what they were experiencing. And so they did not have any knowledge about AMS. And these were the symptoms experienced uh, by the climbers. Just comparing the data we have uh, with other mountains. Now, Mount Kinabalu, the height is uh, again uh, 4,095 meters. When you compare it with other mountains in uh, the Asian region, Mount Fuji is uh, lower and Jade Mountain is lower, but the incidences of AMS is actually higher. So it's not the height, uh, the altitude, only the altitude which is important, it's actually the rate of uh, ascent to your sleeping uh, altitude, number one. Number two, it's also important where you begin. So for example, in uh, Mount Kinabalu, we begin at Laban Rata, which, about, which is about uh, Timpon Gate, which is about 1866 meters. So you start low and you climb slowly to your sleeping altitude. However, if you go to Mount Fuji, probably your starting point is higher. So there's less time for your body to acclimatize. So in Kinabalu, the rate of ascent is really fast. It's only within two days and one night. It's a short hike. There's limited choice of your uh, overnight altitude. Everyone sleeps at Laban Rata. Everyone sleeps at Laban Rata. There's a little time for sleep and recovery. When you uh, arrive at Laban Rata, two o'clock in the morning, you're gonna have to attack the summit. However, this short, fast uh, climbing method is popular amongst, uh, amongst uh, novice climbers. Compare this with the Lake Gokyo hike, which takes about nine days. Um, we will climb slowly and gradually. Uh, we take time to acclimatize. Uh, we sleep at Nam Che Bazaar and during our rest day, it's called rest day. However, we don't rest. We climb up uh, to a high elevation and come down back to sleep. Yeah? So we climb high, but we sleep lower. So this, uh, uh, this is more protective to MS rather than the shock height. A little bit about pathophysiology of uh, AMS and haze. This is a view of uh, Lake Gokyo and the climb up to Gokyo is only 400 meters, but it was a really challenging climb. Eh? So uh, what happens to your body? With increased elevation, there's decreased uh, partial pressure of expired oxygen. You have neurological consequences, but also other body are affected. Eh? So looking at your saturation in your blood, with increasing altitude, yeah, about 4,000, that's where Kinabalu is. Lake Gokyo is in the middle, 5,000, your saturation drops. Yeah? Your body is pretty well accustomed to maintain the saturation up to 3,000 meters, and that's where it starts to drop. Okay, just to show you, just to share with you the my pulse oximeter uh, at Namchi Bazaar. This is at the elevation of 3,400. I was tachycardic, my heart rate is normally 70, it goes up to 105, and my saturation dropped to 
81%. This is your sleeping heart rate. This is just before I slept. So you're sleeping with a fast heart rate with a low saturation. Now, because of hypoxia, because of your inspired oxygen is low, that's why your saturation is low, and your body will adjust uh, to, to maintain the delivery of oxygen to the cell. And how does it adjust? Since your saturation is low, it tries to increase cardiac output by stimulating your sympathetic nervous system and increasing your heart rate. All right. And this was at Anamche Bazaar, 81%. Uh, as I go higher, uh, you can look at the uh, pulse oximeter, it goes lower down to uh, 75. It actually went all the way down to 67%, and your heart rate goes up further up because of oxygen delivery. Uh, uh, the body tries to increase cardiac output. Yeah. And uh, this was at Lake Kokyo at the elevation of 4,700. Saturation was around 70%. However, this was already uh, about a week into our height. And if you notice, the heart rate goes down yeah, from tachycardia to less tachycardia. So your body will slowly acclimatize. What happens at high altitude? There's a decrease in barometric pressure as you go up. Uh, the percentage of oxygen is the same, 21%. However, because decrease in barometric pressure, it affects your inspired oxygen pressure. Yeah? When your inspired oxygen pressure is affected, the driving gradient of oxygen from the, from the blood towards the cell decreases. This is what we call hypobaric hypoxia. Okay? Um, what happens uh, when your body is in hypoxic at a very low, uh, at a very low pressure? The brain is very sensitive. Yeah, it's the first organ to be compromised, and your body kicks your body physiology kicks into action uh, to compensate this in terms of increasing your ventilation, which increases your oxygen. Tachycardia increases your cardiac output, and your kidney will secrete uh, erythropoietin to increase the level of hemoglobin. Yeah, and also uh, since the brain is experiencing hypoxia, there's increased blood flow to the brain. So a little bit about physiology. At uh, sea level, the pressure is 760 mm mercury. When you go further up, it will decrease. So it's a problem of pressure. The, uh, the percentage of oxygen is still the same. When uh, uh, the pressure decreases, the barometric pressure decreases, there's a decrease in inspired oxygen, and this will uh, deliver a decreased oxygen to the cells. So a bit of calculation at sea level, your alveolar oxygen concentration is about 100. When you go up 3,000 meters, this is uh, about the height of Laban Rata, your alveoli oxygen uh, drops to 45 millimeters per curie, yeah? less than half. And your body has to compensate. This is what we call hypobaric hypoxia. So how does the body compensate? You have a carotid body. So the blood will travel to your um, uh, bifurcation of your internal and external carotids where you have a carotid body. It will detect this drop in oxygen and it will stimulate the respiratory center in the medulla to increase ventilation. And this is what we call the hypoxic ventricular response. So that's why when you hike, you become, you feel like you're breathless and your breathing increases. Uh, this increase your minute ventilation is actually protective because you expire more air to increase oxygen. However, there is a braking system. When you expire uh, fast, you blow off CO2, pH rises, you will have alkalosis, and again, your chemoreceptors will detect the change in pH, and it will notify the respiratory center to, to decrease minute ventilation. Eh? So there's a stimul stimulating your ventilation, but there's also a braking system. Now, with high altitude, it also affects uh, the heart uh, by increasing the sympathetic uh, response. Um, remember, your heart rate goes up in, uh, in order to increase the cardiac output. Uh, it also affects the circulation in your lung. Uh, it causes a peripheral vasoconstriction to decrease the BQ mismatch because oxygen is low. So um, vessels will there's a constrict, and this might be the pathophysiology for uh, high altitude pulmonary edema. Now, all this uh, adaptation is well and good. However, if, uh, if the adaptation fails, that's where you get, you get high altitude sickness. 
a bit about more detail about why this happened, a bit about hypo hypothesis uh, on why this happened. Now, there's, if you read the uh, literature, there's something called the tight fit hypothesis, where um, uh, you and me, we are different in terms of our brain and skull composition. Some people have more brain, some people have less brain. So uh, the ability of the brain to cope with swelling actually uh, uh, differs, and that might explain the variability in uh, AMS uh, susceptibility. Some people may have a lot of CSF space, CSF buffer. Uh, those who develop uh, AMS tend to have less CSF buffer, so there's, um, uh, there's less room for the brain to swell, and that's why some people can tolerate increasing uh, blood volume because of the decreased cerebral blood flow or increasing edema, uh, compliant brain, but uh, certain people, even at lower altitude, they might get symptoms of AMS, probably because they have uh, a greater brain to intracranial volume ratio, yeah? Okay, now um, it's known that uh, edema occurs in hypoxia. Uh, the edema may be because, uh, the edema in the brain may be occurs because of vasodilatation of the arteries of the brain. Uh, that explains why steroid helps in terms of prevention and treatment of AMS and haze. Uh, and also CT scan done in climbers with head and haze shows that uh, the brain is uh, swollen. Yeah? And this swelling can happen vasogenic, extracellularly, or it can also happen cytotoxic, intracellular. Now with hypoxia, even at isobaric hypoxia, not, not only uh, um, hypobaric hypoxia, even in isobaric hypoxia, the main cause of edema is extracellular edema, which is mesogenic. However, in AMS, uh, there's an additional component to this edema. Uh, it happens intracellularly, so it's cytotoxic. And they also found micro uh, hemorrhages, uh, uh, mainly uh, in the corpus callosum. And micro hemorrhages is the hallmark of obstruction to, venous, to the venous outflow. So uh, the tight brain hypothesis might be a sim an, an oversimplification of the pathophysiology for AMS or haze. So the modified uh, tight brain hypothesis postulates that when you have, uh, this is your cranium and this is the element in, uh, in your uh, skull, you have the brain. Now with high altitude, remember you might get edema, it might be intracellular or extracellular. And in your brain, you have arteries, you have CSF, yeah? So um, some people have less CSF than others, so that's why they are susceptible to high altitude. With hypoxia, there's increased uh, blood flow of arterial and free blood, and that might contribute to, to the tight, tight brain, yeah? So um, there might be an element of venous hypertension whereby the venous flow is obstructed, and that might have a role in the pathogenesis of, uh, of haze. I will just spend, uh, I got 21 minutes, I just spent a bit of time on this uh, diagram, which is a very important diagram. Uh, this uh, summarizes the pathophysiology of AMS and haze at the molecular level. Eh? So if you can see, this is your artery, this is your arterial, your capillaries, yeah? And then this is your venous system, yeah? Uh, now, there are mediators for haze, which is mechanical. You look at the blue colored uh, uh, boxes are mechanical causes of haze. And also the uh, chemical causes or the uh, PO2 or PCO2, uh, the hypoxemic causes of, of haze. When, uh, when you are hypoxic, there is uh, vasodilatation of vessels. That's where uh, that will contribute to raise hydrostatic pressure. And, uh, and also, just now we discussed about venous vasoconstriction, venous obstruction, that might also increase the risk in hydrostatic pressure. And the effect of pressure will actually damage the blood vessel. Yeah? So when you damage the blood vessel, you can have local leakage of potassium. This will stimulate nitrous oxide, which contributes to more vasodilation. Yeah? And uh, it's actually an interplay between um, between uh, hypoxia, which causes vasodilation, and you get your hyperventilation when the CO2 decrease is being detected by your chemoreceptors and it stops uh, the breathing, so you get vasoconstriction again. So it's the balance between hypoxia 
and hypocapnia, which, uh, uh, which controls the cerebral blood flow. Okay, what about the effect of uh, hypoxemia to the blood vessel wall? You have the sodium potassium pump. Uh, it affects the sodium potassium pump, uh, damages it, and you get uh, intracellular edema. And this uh, will increase ICP and probably contributes to the headache. From hypoxemia, you have uh, mediators, uh, free radicals, HIF1 uh, alpha, which we will uh, dwell into further in the next following slide, will cause upregulation of certain growth factors. And these uh, chemicals can damage the basal membrane and contributes to edema. Adenosine from the uh, hydrostatic effect. Uh, of the vessel, will uh, they will secrete uh, adenosine, which also causes uh, vasodilation. And uh, one of the uh, theory about uh, headache, high altitude headache, is that vasodilation stimulates the trigeminal vascular system, which stimulates um, headache, and it also affects the uh, pain threshold. Okay, what about microhemorrhages because of the trauma from the pressure? and also uh, the effects of chemicals on the blood vessels, you might get microhemorrhages, uh, which might uh, play an important role in the pathogenesis of uh, haze. Okay, treatment. Now, this is the view from Kokyori towards the lake. This is where we stayed overnight before we ascent. Uh, sometimes the only treatment is to go down, yeah? Uh, we were lucky enough in Lukla to visit the hospital. This is uh, Staff Nurse uh, Sakitoshi. Uh, uh, it's the only hospital in Lukla, probably the only hospital in uh, the, uh, that, the only main hospital in the region of Everest and also Gokyori. Uh, and this is the view from the hospital. Eh? Maso hospital, tengok view saja terus baik, eh? tak payah ubat. Uh, however, we did go in and we were invited and they were equipped with, uh, uh, with an ultrasound, ECG machine, uh, there's defib, uh, there's actually an oxygen concentrator, a lot of oxygen, you can see oxygen tank there, and a lot of medication. So we look at the medication that they use for HAIP and HACE, and it's the same as the medication that we brought. It's mainly Dimox, it's mainly uh, Dexa. Uh, ephedipine for hate, yeah. So basically, we are using the same medication. Uh, now, in terms of pharmacotherapy to treat uh, high altitude illness, in terms of prevention and treatment, there's two main aims. One is to increase ventilation. When you increase ventilation, you probably uh, correct your hypoxemia. And remember all those chemicals that occurs with hypoxia. Uh, we want to stop all the inflammation. And uh, that's where the role of steroid comes in. <clears throat> but sometimes in severe symptoms, these do not, uh, uh, is not really effective. And the only way to treat uh, HAI severe cases is to descend and to give oxygen. This is uh, Mr. Pulba, is our guide, very experienced guide, very nice guy. And uh, this is uh, the emergency equipment which he carries, which is an oxygen tank yeah, carried by our potter and also a satellite phone. Yeah. So sometimes you just have to know to call it a day. And I know this proverb uh, does not relate really to Gunung, yeah? uh, but uh, you can always come back uh, another year and not risk your life this year yeah? uh, uh, when you're rushing to, to summit. So if, if the symptoms are severe, you just have to call it a day and just descend. So make a decision to ascend, or sometimes you might just hover at the same altitude and see whether you recover for 24 hours. Um, remember that uh, AMS and haze, it's important uh, to diagnose it early uh, because uh, early treatment is easier and more successful. We actually applied this in all of our members. Anyone with any headache, any anorexia, nausea, even vomiting, we hit them hard uh, with uh, Dimox and Dexa uh, treatment dose. Um, almost everyone took prophylaxis. Once the sy symptoms uh, started, we hit them with treatment dose. And actually recover, uh, recovery is really fast, yeah? They have a bounding severe headache, you give them Dexa, Dimox, they go to sleep, wake up, they're back to normal, yeah? So sometimes with mild AMS, just staying at the same altitude, and waiting for your body to adjust helps. This might take 12 hours, or it might take days. Remember when you're having these symptoms, uh, try not to exert yourself. It makes hypoxia worse and it makes the condition worse. However, 
despite all this therapy, maybe the only treatment might be to descend. Eh? So if you observe and there's no uh, uh, improvement within 24 hours of acclimatization of treatment, you might have to descend. Haze or hate, for sure, you have to come down. Uh, these are the two medication which uh, are the mainstay of prevention and so treatment for hate and AMS. And these are the doses, uh, Dimox or acetazole amide, 125 milligrams BD for prevention for prophylaxis. I think most of us just took 125 once daily. Once we had the headache, we doubled it uh, to BD. Yeah? And uh, with DEXA, we only took two milligrams. Uh, but remember, with your Dimox, you have to take it 24 hours before your ascent. You have to take it early. Uh, dexamethadone is mainly for treatment, rarely for prevention. Yeah? So once we had a bounding headache, we just took four milligrams stack, yeah? and uh, a majority of us uh, recovered. Uh, so these are the field treatment uh, which uh, should be um, applied. So it's not only medication. Uh, if you have a headache, you should not climb, you should rest to acclimatize. Uh, in our schedule, we rested at Namche Bazaar, so it was calculated uh, in our journey. Uh, symptomatic treatment for headache, you can have Panadol or uh, non-steroidal. Um, consider Dimox, yeah? Um, I advise those who had uh, high altitude AMS before, your next line, please take prophylaxis. The chances of you getting uh, AMS in your next line is very high. Or uh, if the headache is so severe, probably you have to descend, yeah? Same with uh, the moderate to severe AMS or even haste uh, treatment, basically summer. But now we are looking at oxygen and uh, probably uh, hyperbaric therapy. Yeah? I have not seen this uh, in Gokyo or even in Kinabalu. Basically, you have a fabric, uh, uh, a hyperbaric chamber. Uh, the pressure is at 2 PSI. So basically, remember when we are up in the mountain, the pressure is low. So basically, you want to create, uh, uh, create a, um, a high pressure in, uh, in, a, in this containment. And it basically correlates to you uh, descending to 1,600 meters. Yeah? OK, so um, amide, uh, it's used uh, very good for prophylaxis and also for therapy. It's drug of choice for prophylaxis. Uh, it's 250 or 125 to 250 once daily or twice daily. Speeds acclimatization, so highly recommended. Yeah, it terminates the illness uh, quickly, so it's used for uh, treatment as well. Now, uh, it inhibits uh, some uh, enzymes, carbonic hydrates in the kidneys. This causes you to pass a lot of urine, which is rich with bicarbonate, causes you to be a bit acidotic metabolic acidosis, and this triggers your breathing. So it triggers the hyperventilation faster. Uh, when you breathe faster, uh, uh, it improves your oxygenation. But remember, when you take Dimox, probably you will be going to the toilet quite often, and you need to uh, keep yourself hydrated. This is Amin sharing his ice, uh, his hot lemon tea on our journey, making sure all of the members are well hydrated. A little bit about dexamethasone. Uh, can be used uh, for prophylaxis up to eight milligrams, but it's mainly used for treatment. Yeah, uh, for treatment, eight milligrams uh, by any route. We actually took four milligrams. Uh, you can start with eight and then four milligrams every six hourly. Yeah, four times a day. You will experience marked improvement with hours of AMS. More for members of our group, took one tablet, four milligram, went to sleep, and woke up uh, fresh. Yeah. It uh, acts by reducing all those chemicals uh, that affects the capillary permeability, so it reverses that. And uh, steroid is normally used for treatment rather than prevention, but in patients who are allergic to Dimox, um, maybe uh, you might consider steroid dexamethasone as prophylaxis. Yeah? And also for uh, uh, rescue personnel who has to ascend very fast, uh, they have to take Dexa and also Dimox together. Okay, it, it's also uh, was found that dexamethasone does not improve acclimatization. Remember just now, 
dimox or estazoamide in terms of antibiotic transition, but that does not happen in, uh, in, in DEXA. So they suggest the use of DEXA to relieve symptoms, yeah, basically as a treatment, and use dimox uh, to speed up acclimatization, which is maybe used for prophylaxis. Yeah? Now, we can, you can assess your risk, uh, whether you develop AMS or not. Eh? Uh, if you want to know your risk, uh, if you had a previous, um, if you had previous uh, AMS, the chance of you getting MS is high in your next climb. Now, if it's high, you should plan your climb gradually, slowly. So uh, try to ascend not more than 2,800 meters on the first day. Try to sleep uh, at a lower altitude, uh, not more than 500 meters from your last uh, sleeping altitude. So you can kind of gauge your risk of developing MS. Yeah? And uh, the advice for prevention is to ascend slowly, uh, don't go fast, uh, sleep at an altitude no higher than 300 meters, yeah? and every 1,000 meter you climb, you need a rest day to acclimatize. Yeah? Avoid alcohol and sedative hypnotics for the first two nights. This will disturb your breathing, especially during when you're sleeping. And initially, in the first few days, try to avoid heavy exertion. So take it easy, you know, just hike slowly, uh, allow your body to adjust. For prevention, again, Dimox is superb, yeah, acetazole amide, uh, especially for those at moderate to severe risk. Please take Dimox, start it 24 hours before you hike. And normally, we continue until you summit it and you descend, yeah. Dexamethasone is reserved for treatment, yeah. Um, and uh, because of its side effects, and they also suggested if you're using it for prophylaxis or for treatment, try not to move, uh, use it more than seven days because of adrenal suppression. Yeah, a little bit about prevention. This is a study done again by Dr. Atfina. Now remember, uh, just now we mentioned that the climbers who experienced AMS, sixty percent did not know anything about AMS. Uh, despite 25% uh, of them having uh, experienced AMS, yeah, 64% or 6% had zero or limited knowledge, knowledge about AMS. And among those who had AMS, 5.3% were unaware. Yeah? It was like me during my first climb in Kinabalu. So this limited knowledge and limited awareness of AMS to recognize the symptom expose uh, our climbers to potential injuries. Yeah? So what can we do? Having knowledge about AMS helps in terms of diagnosing, so you can treat it early and in terms of monitoring. So the mountain guide can play an important role. Uh, what can we do? They can pre-brief the client. Uh, Mr. Purba actually was really aware about AMS and gave us a briefing. And actually every night he will go around our room just to listen to our breathing, yeah? just to listen whether we're sleeping or not, uh, monitoring us. So when you recognize an early sign of AMS in your colleague, yeah, or even the mountain guide in their client, they need to monitor, portion them, portion the client, uh, portion the climber and monitor them symptomatically. Uh, and also it's important when a patient is having AMS, they are prone to uh, fall and misstep, which may cause, uh, it may be fatal. Yeah? So it is suggested that the standardized content of briefing sessions should be given by the mountain guide to all the climbers. So all climbers will receive the same advice before ascent. And uh, educational material should be uh, uh, available online yeah? uh, on the website and at every hut uh, on the trail uh, to describe the symptoms and signs of AMS and remind climbers uh, about it. Yeah? So this is the poster uh, done by Dr. Atfina and team. Uh, it was given to uh, Kinabalu Park, I believe Sabah Park, uh, and, uh, and, and it's good for uh, education and awareness of uh, AMS eh, to, uh, to the mountain guide and also to the climber. So uh, basically what I showed you just now, a nice summary, uh, a nice poster for awareness and how to prevent AMS by going slowly, hydrate, and taking your prophylaxis. Um, because we want to avoid this, we want to avoid uh, uh, you being, um, being fatigued and tired and need to be evacuated. Just to inform that uh, up on Kinabalu, we have Abang Abang Bomba, yeah, located at different location. And this uh, is, uh, is their invention. It's located at the hut 
And uh, when I went up in 2018, they were evacuating uh, a climber who had AMS. Uh, so these Abang Bomber are actually Malim Gunung, uh, and they are stationed in Ranawa. Very, very experienced and very strong people. Uh, a question that uh, some of you might ask, why do Sherpa tolerate hypoxia? So this is my, this is, uh, Mr. Korba, at the same altitude as I was. Look at his carpal filter, 90%, and he's not tachycardic at all. Yeah? Compare that to mine, yeah, I'm lower saturation and tachycardic, yeah. And this is Mr. Purba, you know, he hikes very fast, sits down. <laughs> so why are they special? Eh? Why do they adjust quickly without discomfort? Some of us develop some AMS symptoms and we rec recover, but some of us develop AMS symptoms and do not recover, yeah? do not recover despite acclimatization and treatment. Now, there might be a genetic component to AMS. There's genetic polymorphism. Uh, there's actually um, HIF1 alpha, hypoxia inducible factor 1 alpha, uh, which is um, which was found a lot in the Sherpas. Yeah, Sherpa. Uh, so, this is a master regulator on hypoxic response to human. Yeah, so probably this Sherpa has, um, uh, has, has this gene uh, which uh, modulates yeah? hundreds of other genes. And uh, this might explain uh, the memory for acclimatization, which I will explain. So HIF controls other genes, and uh, these, these uh, genes will stimulate the process in your body, for example, the production of EPO in the kidney. So because of their genetic uh, polymorphism, they have an advantage uh, to uh, adapt uh, at high altitude. And when you go to high altitude and you spend two weeks, three weeks, when you come down, um, and when you start again, memory acclimatization because of these genes. These genes are activated and they will continue despite you coming down to sea level and going up again, but you have a memory acclimatization. Yeah? Now, uh, during our hike, uh, of course, we were thinking about uh, uh, AMS. Uh, being an emergency physician, I'm worried about anaphylaxis, so we bought uh, adrenaline with syringes. Yeah? Uh, worried about ACS, uh, we brought medication for that, and asthma. However, <clears throat> the most common things that happen is our daily AGE, you know, our cough, runny nose, abdocolic. So this is uh, uh, Dr. Isa, uh, she's a GP, one of my team members. She was the busiest amongst us all. Uh, not only did she treat us uh, the, among, among the hiking members, she also treat um, uh, the locals. Yeah? And this is uh, Dr. Mani, is an orthopedic surgeon, uh, putting some, uh, some dressing on a burnt uh, finger. Yeah? And uh, once they knew we were doctors, uh, quite a few came to consult, uh, to consult us uh, about uh, various medical condition. Uh, most of them are skin problems. Yeah? Now, this is just to remind uh, me, myself, and you all. Uh, this was a day taken, uh, one day taken before the hike. It was a nice fruit stall. Uh, we went there and bought some uh, uh, pineapple juice. And uh, lo and behold, the next day, both of us, me and Amin, suffered uh, diarrhea. It was not pleasant hiking for 12 hours with diarrhea. So, uh, lesson learned is never try anything before your hike. Uh, just be careful before your hike. After your hike, then you can go and try any roadside food and drinks. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, AMS is becoming more common. It happens with altitude more than 2,500, but in susceptible people, it can happen uh, at an altitude of 2,000. Why does this happen? It's because of hypobaric hypoxia, right? And the brain is uh, susceptible to hypoxia. Uh, you might get AMS, which is just headache with non-specific symptoms, but it might progress to haze. There are different in, uh, although it's the same spectrum, there are some genetic and molecular uh, mechanism uh, which uh, makes these two conditions different. Yeah, And uh, it's important for us to be aware. Uh, awareness and early diagnosis is vital because we can prevent 
by uh, uh, planning our client, by taking prophylaxis. And once you diagnose it, you can treat it earlier and, um, and be familiar with uh, acetazoamide and dexamethasone. And remember, oxygen is important and sometimes you have to decide uh, to dissent. These are my references. Um, now, despite all this complication, I highly recommend that uh, you go and climb mountains. The world is our playground. You are missing a lot if you're not climbing mountains. You can start with Kinabalu, start a local mountain and see whether you have AMS or not. Uh, try and use uh, prevention in terms of uh, planning your climb, and use the prophylaxis. Uh, and uh, once you've uh, conquered Kinabalu, probably you can travel other areas of the world and uh, experience the slice of heaven. Another thing I would like to encourage you is to join our special interest. We have a society called Wilderness and Austere Medicine Society of Malaysia. I was fortunate enough to be a member and I learned a lot uh, before climbing and I use that knowledge uh, for the benefit of myself and my group. Uh, this is on Facebook. You can go to Facebook and look at the, the many activities done by the society. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed listening to this lecture as I have enjoyed preparing and presenting it. And that's my email. I welcome any comments and uh, any questions uh, for today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sohailan. It was definitely a very uh, enjoyable trip uh, through your, your uh, experience sharing. And uh, you presented very well uh, from, from the pathophysiology to prevention and management of uh, AMS. So I think uh, we just can have, uh, due to time constraint, we have uh, we can select one quick question. Uh, okay, from uh, Nasrina. Uh, Nasrina, you want, uh, do you want to unmute yourself and ask it live? Okay. <laughs> Ah, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Sahila, is there any physical uh, um, risk factor such as, you know, like for if you're diving, maybe having a lot of uh, body fat composition compared to muscle, you have a high risk of developing decompression sickness, for example. Is there is there anything, uh, any risk factor you can find off um, from the physical, um, I mean, risk factor per se in developing AMS? Very good question, Dr. Nasrin. Actually, um... AMS happens in those who are young and those who are fit. Uh, I don't think it relates to any uh, physiological uh, advantage or disadvantage. It's just the matter of being young and being fit, you try to ascend fast. Yeah. So um, one of the members of my group is not young and not fit, and he managed to, uh, uh, to, to reach uh, Lake Gokyo. So uh, how we did it, we did it very gradually and we use a lot of uh, prophylaxis medication. So just to answer your question, I don't think uh, being, uh, being a bit uh, on the chubby side uh, or waiting for you to get fit before you go and hike in mountain is a prerequisite eh, to, to, to hike uh, in terms of avoiding AMS. Uh, but for uh, certain clients, I think you need a moderate level of fitness, yeah, moderate level of fitness um, uh, and uh, a bit of preparation. But you don't have to be super fit. You don't have to be an ultra marathoner to climb mountains. Yeah? So nothing to do with fitness. I think uh, those who are young and fit tend to ascend fast and tend to be a bit cocky. And that's when uh, they are humbled by the mountain. Okay, just a, a quick one from uh, Prof. Kaudun. Uh, Prof. Kaudun, do you, do, do you want to unmute yourself and uh, ask one question? I think I, I see you ask uh, many questions here, but we can only have time for one question. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Prof. Okay, sorry. Just, just uh, regarding uh, singing, uh, Azamani did uh, his PhD study, I think. Uh, how does that affect uh, your oxygen concentration? Okay, Will uh, that be of benefit? Maybe when you go hiking, you should all be singing yep, I, or, I, or, or, or whistling. That will help as well. 
Yes, yes. Uh, I think even uh, Dr. Alzamani's study, when you sing in your brain, uh, in your mind, uh, without opening your mouth, um, it has a an effect which improves your uh, saturation. Yeah? But what I can say is when you sing, you tend to breathe. Yeah? Uh, now remember, Dimox uh, increase your uh, ventilation by, by, by producing metabolic acidosis. And uh, that is a protective effect. Yeah? When you hyperventilate, you inspire more, your inspired oxygen goes up and that improves oxygenation. Yeah? So, so um, but uh, having said that, uh, pulse oximeter uh, can be uh, uh, very uh, misleading uh, because it depends on, uh, uh, on, on the temperature. Yeah, you can have vasoconstriction and all. But, but I think through al uh, uh study, uh, he's shown that uh, singing, uh, probably, I think, through the mechanism of uh, ventilation of breathing improves uh, improves uh, oxygenation. And when you improve oxygenation, you can avoid or you can uh, minimize the risk of AMS. I think uh, what, what that singing exercise does mainly not improve breathing, but also as you already pointed out, the importance of uh, pressure. So the PEEP, uh, when you sing, you close your vocal cords, that increase the peep into your alveoli. So I think that is actually one of the reasons. But singing in the mind uh, may translate into you subconsciously also affect your breathing uh, pattern uh, to, the, to the rhythm of the music in your mind. So probably that also helps in terms of your either rate of breathing or also your, the, 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 the way you breathe uh, in terms of uh, singing to the tune, you know, increasing your peak. Uh, that's my take on, on Azamani's uh, study. Right. Uh, with that, uh, thank you everyone for the participation on the first lecture. Uh, I see there's uh, a few more questions, but due to time constraint, uh, we cannot allow uh, to ask live, but you all feel free to uh, type in your questions uh, into our Facebook group at uh, uh, Neuro EMSIG.